Okay. So thank you so much for joining us today. I know it's January, it's just the beginning of the year. Happy New Year, everybody. But the talk today hopefully is going to be fun. Um, this was my idea for Java 1 last year. And to be honest with you, I'm always looking for how to have fun. Uh, what is the next thing that I'm going to be working with? And what do we have out there? So simply, I have my Raspberry Pi. How many of you have the Raspberry Pi? Yes, one, two, two. So a couple of you might have heard about the Raspberry Pi, already own a Raspberry Pi. It's a lot of fun. It's just so many things that you can do with it. So we have the Raspberry Pi, and then we have small screens that we can actually plug into the Raspberry Pi so you can actually have a display. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's nice. And then you have all the um, IO pins on the Raspberry Pi that you can connect stuff to. So last year I did a presentation here, and I think pretty much all of you were here, I don't remember faces, where we actually use um, some of the IO pins. And I decided, okay, let's try something different. There is a port um, on these IO pins that are uh, using the protocol I square C. And Seriously, I haven't played with it before. I thought it would be a nice idea to do some research on it, find out what devices come using I square C and what could I do with it. So I found out that a lot of the gyroscope and accelerometers use the I square C. And the good thing about the I square C, and I talk a little bit more about it, is there is a bus and I can connect a bunch of guys there as long as they have different addresses. So I'm like, oh, cool, I have my Raspberry Pi, I can connect stuff to the I square bus. What about gyroscope accelerometer? So I have information about positioning, right? Then I have a screen, I say, okay, I love JavaFX because I've been a fan of JavaFX from the beginning. And even though when we talk about embedded, we always need a UI right interface. So I come and I actually build my own kind of tablet. It's homemade. Um, it doesn't look as nice as the Duke pad, if you're seeing one from the Jasper Duke pad, but, but I'm proud of it because it was pre Duke pad and it was built by me. So, so we basically have um, the Raspberry Pi, the screen, homemade case, um, a gyroscope and accelerometer in one chip that is using I square C. So my whole idea was, okay, I know we are on embedded, UIs need to be simplified. We want to be simple UI, but they don't have to be ugly. So I was trying to incorporate some of the positioning information provided by the gyroscope and accelerometer to control my screen to have some of 3D kind of uh, environment without really needing to go into 3D. I studied 3D many years ago at the university. I didn't want to go back into just building a whole 3D interface for embedded. So that was the whole kind of inspiration for the project. Do something nice, try something that I haven't tried before, and just, again, have fun, have a lot of, have a lot of fun. Um, um, so, again, we, I love making things look beautiful. That's one of the things. I'm always building UIs. I built the user interface they used last year in um, a DevOps. Um, it was a nice UI, all built in JavaFX. So I, I'm always looking for having nice looking UIs, which is actually getting harder when you have embedded devices. So you have to go simply. Um, Current UIs, I didn't want it to be totally static. If we have uh, a small device that you can flip around, turn, you should incorporate that information to do something in the UI. So as I move, I should be moving the screen and stuff like that. So I wanted to have really dynamic screens um, that react to positioning, etc. Again, JavaFX, it was perfect a fit for me. Um, and putting all together was the experience and that was about the talk. So one of the first questions that it come to my mind, we have the Raspberry Pi. You can have either Java SE embedded on the Raspberry Pi or Java ME embedded on the Raspberry Pi. So first question is which one should I take? So there are decisions that you have to make. When you go with Java ME embedded, you have a really nice API for accessing all the peripherals. So you have the device access API that allow you to very easily connect to peripherals. I square C, SPI, just general um, IO pins, etc. 
but I didn't have JavaFX. So for my project, I really went through using Java SE embedded, even though I didn't have the device access API on it as part of it. I'm gonna show you that I found another um, a, um, library available that allow me to connect to peripherals in a very easy way. But again, when you're talking about, when you're looking into your devices, embedded devices, you really have to choose, okay? On one side, I really wanna have UI, another side will be a little bit harder because it, the, the, the peripheral talk wasn't part of the platform itself. But again, I mean, there is doable, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, SE Embedded is also looking into incorporate device access API in the future. So that's something that will be solved in the future, but as it is today, I have to come with a solution for my particular project. Um, so I want to walk you through this. Um, all the, the talk that I have today, I blog about it. So if you want to go in more details or do it yourself at home, you can actually follow my blog. Um, so we're going to walk through the hardware. So the Raspberry Pi, I won't spend much time on it. I think I have one slide because there have been, you know, Raspberry Pi has been around for a while and we pretty much know about it. I do want to stop on the protocol. Again, I'm not a hardware person. So it actually took me a little bit to go back, research, see how the protocol works and what the API was doing for me. Um, the good thing, even though I show you the protocol, the APIs of course hide all the low level details. So it's actually pretty good, but it's good to know what, what you're using. Enabling I square C on the Raspberry Pi. So when you get the Raspberry Pi documentation, it say it has I square C and SPI available. I'm like, yes. So you always expect to connect things and start working, but that's not true. <laughs> you always connect things and never work. So I found out the hard way that I square C is not enabled by default on the Raspberry Pi. So there were a few steps that I have to follow to actually enable the I square C. So I document all that. Then the hardware that I use, um, there's no particular reason. This board that I use is MPU9150. It was actually very good because it has a lot of information in one single chip. So we have an accelerometer and a gyroscope, and it also has a temperature sensor. So it was a, a lot of stuff in just one single chip. It was a little bit more expensive. We're talking about like 50 bucks, pretty much more expensive than the Raspberry Pi itself. But you know, you can just, just change it and take a, a cheap accelerometer. I did wanna have both accelerometer and gyroscope. So if you think about it, what I was trying to do is have my UI react to positioning, right? So like navigate through the environment using um, you know, my, the, the movement on the device. So the accelerometer will tell me if I'm doing an angle Right, so the accelerometer will detect things like, the, like this. And we're measuring against gravity, so I can find out what inclination I have here, what angle I am doing. While the gyroscope will allow me to detect if I have an angular acceleration, if I'm rotating, right? So for me to move the screen, if I rotate, I detect that by the gyroscope. Once I stopped, the gyroscope is not going to give me any reading because I don't have any angular acceleration. I stopped. This is when the accelerometer come handy because the accelerometer is actually reading some angle. So I have to really combine the angular acceleration that detect, yes, you're moving, but once you're stopped and you're doing an angle, the accelerometer will give me that information. Like, okay, if you're still doing an angle, keep moving. If you're flat, stop the movement. So it's really a combination of, of two things in there, accelerometer and gyroscope. So again, this chip has everything in one, so it was easier. The registries that hold the information was one next to each other, so I can actually read all of them and use it. So I just, I, it just came handy for me. Why that one and not another one? And it, it used I square C that it was the protocol that I wanted to test on the Raspberry Pi. Chalkboard electronic is the LCD screen. Um, They're supposed to have a smaller screen. Um, I don't think it's out yet, out there yet. They're telling that. Yeah, they had some production issues. I think they got some early versions out, but it's not quite, quite I there. Got mine yet. 
Okay, so I'm still using the old one, which is actually pretty, pretty decent size. And we do have um, a promotion code if you are interested in getting your own screen for the Raspberry Pi. I think it's very handy. Then the software, again, I'm going to talk about. Uh, found using I square C again because I was using Java SE embedded rather than ME embedded. Um, and then I found out um, this principle is parallax. It's nothing new, it's been used a lot, especially in the past year for um, game programming. So bringing that back a little bit and just use it. And again, all FX for the implementation. So just a snapshot of the Raspberry Pi. Again, I'm not going to spend much time on it. Um, the here has the, 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 the pins that we are able to connect stuff to, and I'll have a, a better view of it um, later on. Um, so what is really important here, so yes, we know it has a CPU that is ARM 11, a system on a chip kind of package, the memory is, what really interests us is the IO connectivity. So we have some header pins um, and pretty much why I select I square C is because I haven't done, I did work with this before and I have a summary of the demos that we did last time, but pretty much trying to do something that I didn't do before. Um, so in last presentation, we cover um, serial communication. We cover USB with the Raspberry Pi and simple GPIO uh, kind of connectivity. Again, I square C was something new. And uh, again, there are many devices. The more you search about I square C, the more cool devices that you find, like the Wii has a motion plus we actually use i square c so you can actually i took apart one of the I, one of those devices and tried to plug it in i haven't done much you know, but it's supposed the, the part of it. yeah so <laughs> so it's supposed to give you more accurate positioning so there is once you have the protocol working it's a lot of great ideas i actually working um on a new idea that is actually long time ago when i joined sun that's like 13 years ago, <laughs> so don't make the calculations there. <laughs> like 13 years ago, when I first joined the team, we have a demo that it was a wearable PC. So you can imagine 13 years ago, the CPU was huge, where we have all cables around, we have a wheel looking headset, we have a hand uh, mouse. Uh, it, was, it was pretty nice. And I think I'm, 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 I'm having the idea of bringing that back uh, because we have the Raspberry Pi that is tiny. I found a pair of glasses on Adafruit that are like $90. Uh, of course, there are no like the Google glasses, but they're pretty good. And I'm planning to take those apart and put it in, a, in one hat and, you know, play with really wearable um, <laughs> PC nowadays. So it's a lot of good ideas, you know. We say not very useful, but a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, so these are a little bit back on the GPIO pins. Um, so here is the two pins that are, we're going to be using for um, I square C. There is one line for data and one line for clock that we were um, we will discuss um, later on in more details. And we have the SPI pins over here that I'm not really covering today. So this is in the past, um, a summary of the different things that we did. Uh, one thing when you're talking about embedded, having a console to your embedded device is very useful. Most of the time you don't even have screen or UI. Um, so straight from the Raspberry Pi, you have a uh, WART lines. But remember, those are using only 3.3 volts is the TTL level. And we need to bumper up to 12 volt signals. Um, that's the standard for RS232. Um, so for that one, we use the max uh, 3232 just to ramp up um, um, the voltage there and have the serial console uh, to the Pi. So it was very straight connection, just a couple of um, um, things connected. So it's not, not very difficult. Um, this was one of the guys that gave me the most nightmare. It was a robot that I have to put together like within four hours. 
and it has like a million of screws and I always blame Simon for it. Um, but it was cool. The, the idea with this, it has a USB and if you plug it into the Raspberry Pi and if you take the USB device, pretty much you should be able to talk to it. So the way it was done was using GNI. So I don't go into the details, but uh, pretty much we have uh, native uh, code uh, and then we have GNI um, around it. And so because it was very low level kind of um, robot arm, we did have to do some synchronization uh, and calibration. So once you move, um, it has, it can open and close. One you open, you have to wait and you have to stop that movement before you go to the next one. So very simple details. And then also GPIOs. Uh, so you have a lot of GPIO pins available in the Raspberry Pi. So cool things and easy things will be connect some motors. In this case, we use some of the Lego motors in the old versions. And again, we use a dual H bridge and we were able to control two motors at the same, at the time. So pretty simple, just moving two motors in the Lego. Again, pretty straightforward connection with the Raspberry Pi. And now I square C. So again, the only reason why I went to square C is just play with something new. Uh, how does it work? And I found a bunch of uh, devices that use it. So I found that it will be like really, really useful to have that connectivity ready. Um, uh, the I square It uses a serial interface and it's synchronous. So the da data is going to be moved along the clock signal. So the master will control the clock signal. Um, and the clock rate can vary, can change. The master has control of that, unlike a synchronous uh, kind of protocols. And it could be bidirectional. So this is uh, a little bit of the design. So. Um, I don't know, my face over there is kind of blocking my diagram, so <laughs> I don't know. Oh. When I, when I took your video off, it cut the audio. Okay. <laughs> so, give me a second. Sorry. No, no, it's not <laughs> my, it's, it's, it's technical issues. No, turn. No, it didn't, it didn't work that time. Can you hear me now? Uh, okay, so let's try. All right, now keep talking. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. So basically there are two buses, one for data and one for the clock signal. Um, there's only one master at the time, they can change. Uh, so one slave can become a master and one master can turn into slave, but there is only one master active at the time. Uh, addressing is seven bit address. Um, and then we have a pull up resistors. Normally for I square C you do require door resistors. The Raspberry Pi's includes those pull up resistors. So you don't require to have any extra resistors in your system. And we will look at the, at the um, setting later on. A little bit of information about the protocol itself. Um, so you will have a start communication and end communication signal. For the start communication signal, so what's going to happen is we're going to have a high on the clock and the master will send a signal from high to low while the clock is high. This means there's a start conversation. For the end of conversation, again, the clock has to be high and the master will say a low to high signal while the clock is high. So those are the two signals to begin the conversation and to end the conversation. And then when you want to transfer data, um, so again, we're going to transfer 8-bit longs. And after the 8 bits, we do need to send an acknowledgement. So every time the clock is high, we can transfer data. 
So when the clock is high is when you do the communication of data. One, two, three at the eighth, and then the last one, the ninth, is when the, the receiver acknowledge the, the, that he got the information. The whole communication will be like this, and a start condition and a stop condition, who you're addressing, because remember there could be multiple people attached to the same boss. So who you're addressing to, if it's reading or writing, and then acknowledgement, and then the communication start. Data, acknowledge, data, acknowledgement, until the stop signal happen. Um, so it's a lot of things going on in the I-square protocol. The good thing is you don't have to deal with any of these low-level details because of the um, APIs. But I just didn't want to delete those slides because I want to show you really what the work of the APIs is doing. Again, um, when I connected, so it seems to be so simple, I didn't need any resistors. Um, so it was like one-on-one -on -one connectivity. My surprise is I2C is not enabled. There is like a blacklist uh, file somewhere that needs to be cleaned before I2C is enabled. So uh, you need to add a couple of lines. Uh, under ETC modules, you need to include the I2C. Uh, I did install I2C tools. I think it was very easy to allow you to see if you are actually, the device is actually detecting the devices. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I think it's very useful. It's not required, but it's useful. And then there is a blacklist. So under etc modprov.d, there is a blacklist. If you are in that list, it means that it's not working by default. You have to remove this line. So SPI is not enabled either by default. I square C is not enabled by default. So remove those two lines before you can actually do something. Um, so again, can you see the devices? So the picture is not very good, but when you do I score C detect, you specify either bus one or zero. Um, normally zero is for older version of the Raspberry Pi, normally it's bus one. But anyway, so here um, you can actually, well, barely see, there is a device found at address 40, and there's another one that is seen at address 70. Um, so once you see the device, it's a good news, you at least see the devices, then it's time to test programming them. Under the dev directory, you should see this. Uh, now SPI and I2C should be in there. Uh, if no, just try to run again mod pro with the I2C dev, just to make sure everything is working. So again, just a few steps that you have to do for enabling um, I2C and SPI at the same time. So this is um, the hardware that I use. Again, no particular um, reason for it. Uh, just I found it useful, this particular board, because it has an accelerometer, a gyroscope, temperature sensor, a bunch of information in the same chip. Um, it has also a compact. I'm not really using the compacts. And also you can adjust the sensibility of the device. So it's not the same if you're trying to sense a wheel in a car rotating and my rotation of the device. So you really have to adjust the sensibility and this one allow you to do so. Um, it has um, the pin AD0, the third one from the bottom up allow you to either ground it or not, so you can have two devices on the same bus. There will either be 68 or 69 address, depending if you ground that pin. So just by switching the less significant bit of, of, of the board. Um, not really needing two, but just in case if you need two, um, you can ground one and have two different addresses. And then the voltage uh, supply that we needed was perfect for the Raspberry Pi. Um, so connecting things again, uh, so we have these two data and clock signal and then voltage and ground in some of the pins. So it was really one-to-one -one connectivity. Uh, again, because of the Raspberry has the pull-up resistors, otherwise you will have to put one resistor between the connectivity, but no, just one-to-one, -one, pretty much ground-to-ground, -ground, voltage to three voltage and the Raspberry Pi, data-to-data, -data, bus and clock-to-clock. 
So really simple. And then remember to ground or not this pin over here. And that address is the one that you have to use in your code. So this is the screen. Uh, I have the 10 inches. Uh, it's a touch screen, so it's actually pretty nice. It's pretty decent one. And again, if you want a discount, the, the manufacturer is Chalborg Electronics. They are in Malaysia. Uh, the only drawback for this is the shipping is a little expensive. I think the shipping for, for the screen is like 50 bucks. And the screen itself is like 100 130, 140. So shipping is, is pretty expensive because it comes all the way from Malaysia. But I think it's a really great solution. And again, you can build. My, I was really proud because my, my daughters, they, they play with the iPad all the time. I'm, I'm not so proud of that part. But my little ones saw this, like, Mommy, can I watch Disney on this? I'm like, no, honey, that's mommy's work. But still, I mean, you can build your own low-budget tablet. Um, would work. So this was the first prototype. Uh, uh, we cannot really see much. The projector. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Uh, so we have the screen over here, <laughs> the part that we don't really see, and then I put everything on. A, so the idea was to have over, or everything on the same plane, so I can actually get the reading from the sensors. Um, there was a light sensor, I still haven't corrected that. There's a light sensor for the, for the screen, so it will adjust uh, the brightness of the screen that comes with the screen itself. Touch sensor for the screen goes through USB to the Raspberry Pi. And then I have my chip MPU9150, and then I also use an accelerometer. So while I was testing things, I also have the ADXL345 as an accelerometer. I just started with just accelerometer. Once I got it working, I moved into accelerometer and gyroscope kind of information. So I have it both in the board, and I just plug it to, to the pins. I think that's good enough. Thank you the cameraman. Um, for the software, um, again, um, Java SE uh, embedded doesn't have connectivity, uh, doesn't have the APIs uh, directly for accessing uh, peripherals. I found um, this one, Wiring Pi, is a native library. Um, it's written in C, and it was inspired by Arduino wiring packages. And it has all the core input and output for the Raspberry Pi. So it's very well done, has access to GPIO pins, IS2C, SPI, wired lines, so pretty much everything we needed. It also comes with a common line utility GPIO to program set up the pins. The good uh, news about this is it has a wrapping about it, so we have Pi for Java. So these guys, Robert Savage and Chris Walls, did an awesome job, and they have um, a Pi for Java kind of API that is just a bridge between the native library writing a Pi um, to access the Raspberry Pi. Um, they were actually a Java one last year, so they have a presentation about uh, the Pi for Java, if you want to have a look at the presentation. And again, they have uh, groups, um, Google groups, and they're on Twitter. They're very responsive. I interchange a couple of emails with them with questions and stuff like that. Um, the library is so good, it actually comes with some demos. So you have actually some work, some uh, code to start with. Um, it was amazing. So you find a solution around it. Um, this is a little bit of what the Pi for Java is. So again, all about GPIOs, how to export, import, set the direction, edge, detect, edge detect, detection, um, the states. And again, not just for the GPIOs, but everything. I square C, SPI communication. So it's, it's really well done. This is where you can get it, can get it from. Steve still have me there, but uh, that's fine. Um, you can find it also in my blog. Just install it, check that everything is there. The samples directory should be there. And again, it's just, just make sure you add it to your class path for compilation and running, not rocket science there. Very easy to use. Again, build demos, start working with demos, or uninstall it if you just don't need it. So come very handy.
So a little bit of the code of how to use Pi for Java. Uh, so the first sample was just to use a switch uh, connected to one of the GPIO pins. Again, in this case, um, is number two. Uh, be careful, the GPIO pins IDs do not correspond with the number of the pins of the Raspberry Pi. Don't ask me why, I have no idea, but they do not correspond. Different, so in, different Pi models have the um, physical pins slightly Modified. Okay. So the wiring pi library tried to standardize on them. <laughs> so there's a okay. wiring pi standard, which regardless of which pi board maps to Oh, the same. much to the same. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so in this case, the, the switch is connected to uh, pin 2. And then for the code, it's actually um, simple. From the GPIO factory, you can get an instance of the controller. And from the controller, you actually get connection to your pin. In this case, you are connected to GPIO pin and how you're going to read it. You can add listener to your particular pin, so you listen to changes into your pin if you're high or low or changing a state and just print information. Um, so one method to, to implement handle GPIO pin, digital signal state change. Uh, then if you want to stop all um, the GPIO controller, you just shut it down. So very straightforward how to connect to the GPIOs and here to the state um, change. Then for I square C, it's even simpler. Um, so first you get a connection to your, to your bus. And from your bus, you try to connect to your device. In this case, my device was 68. Um, we're actually not seeing any of the comments on my code. So these are not blank, these are comments, but that's okay. <laughs> Don't change it. <laughs> that's okay, I can put it out with the mouse, that's fine. Um, the funny thing again, uh, you plug things and you expect everything to work right away. Um, I connect the, yes, I connect um, the sensor. I was, I was able to detect the device, but I was not able to get any reading. So no matter how I flip it, it didn't read me, give me anything. Well, I didn't know that by default, this particular chip is in a, in, it's, it's on sleep mode. So you have to wake him up. And the way you wake him up is by writing zero in two registries. So <laughs> believe it or not, it took me like the whole day or even more trying to find out because the documentation for the chip is like at 260 pages trying to find out that you have to wake him up. <laughs> so start reading. So, but anyway, once you find that out, everything is <laughs> way easier. Um, so just write zeros on those two registries again, just to wake him up, and then uh, configure the gyroscope and the accelerometer. Again, this is, um, I don't remember, but again, this is part of the documentation. Some of the bits are for the um, sensibility of the device, and other, others are for if you want to do testing mode on your device. So just turn it on off some of the testing and sensibility, so I don't remember exactly what I put, but you can play with that. The tricky part again was these two lines to wake him up. Once you're done with that, you, I start getting some readings, okay? Um, um, so for the reading, um, so we have three X's uh, data for the accelerometer and the gyroscope, X, Y, and Z. Each of them was 16 bits. So we need to read uh, two bytes two consecutive bytes and put it together and that was the X value and the same for Y and Z. Um, so the way we do the reading is you start on the registry that you want to read. In this case, uh, the accelerometer, the information is starting 3B, that's the first registry. And we're reading six bytes because we need two for the X, two for Y, and two for Z. And we have to concatenate those. So that's pretty much what, we, what we're saying. A step on registry three, three B and read six bytes. Uh, I can actually read six and six, 12, 14 bytes because the way the registry are accelerometer, then the next two registries are temperature values, the temperature sensor, and the other six registries are um, the gyroscope. So I can actually read the 14 and use them. Um, so you read the data, 
And then again, you are concatenated the um, most significant and less significant bits of the value that you're reading and, and use it. And pretty much for the gyroscope is the same. You start at the beginning of the registries, 43, and you're gonna read six registries and then concatenate the two values for X, Y, and Z. Oh my goodness, we have like two <laughs> chocolate <laughs> cookies and oh my God. So that was pretty much about the hardware, um, you know, how to connect things. And it's actually pretty simple once you figure out the, the small things that the small things that take the most of your time because programming was just uh, the easiest part. Um, so um, a little bit of the principle um, going back um, to the UI. So I use the parallax principle and it's, it, we see it every day when we are driving. Uh, if you're in position A, you will see the tree being to the right hand side of the mountain as you drive by the tree will be located on the left hand side. Nothing has changed in the environment, it's just your perspective, your point of view on the, on the environment. Um, so it gives you an, an illusion of depth in a 2D uh, environment. So the, 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 the things that are closer to you will move faster than the things that are farther away. So that's the principle, pretty much. Not on a diet. <laughs> no New Year resolution? No. Okay, I'm on vacation this week, so next, next, my New Year resolution is start next Monday, so <laughs> I have pizza, cookie, everything. <laughs> um, I found a very good article about the vanish point. Um, when you, you want to do a parallax effect in a small area, in a small uh, environment, you can, uh, uh, Steve, I need like a little bit <laughs> less contrast. Um, so you really need a vanished point. Um, Hernan Cortez, if you Google his name, um, I'm sure you'll find the article. If no, I think I have the link for his articles. Um, did a, uh, an article about how to find a vanish point. Is, how, is, is that point where the things are relative to when they move? Uh, so is that point, and, and the way he did it is, we cannot really see, there is a wall here on the right hand side. There it is, a little better. So he took two lanes following the 3D parallel lines in that wall, and when they actually cross, that's the vanish point. That's where you want things to move relative to. Um, he also crossed two, um, used two lines parallel to the floor and to that wall, and traced that particular line here. And then that um, math allow you to find out how fast or how slow each layer will move in relation to the vanish point. Um, for doing the UI, so again, the whole idea is to have layers, as many layers as you can have. Uh, the longest that it took for the project was to build the UI because the more layers, the more reality, realism that you're going to have in your UI and it's what it takes the most. And again, thanks to Photoshop, I'm a Photoshop addict, I was able to create the layers and create the layers and play with the layers. So consume a lot of time, the more the better, the more layers the better. It is time consuming but it's worth it. Um, so my UI is a little bit of childish. Uh, this is the UI, this is an environment that I have a jungle where I have, you know, monkeys, ducks, a lions, a river, stuff like that. And I'm just going to place them in a different layers and try to move them at a different speed. So this is pretty much how the final screen looks like. Um, oops. So again, uh, JavaFX, well, this is a JavaFX user group, so I expect that most of all of us love JavaFX, play with it, like it. I think it was a great fit for uh, what I was trying to do. Um, first, I need a nice looking UI, easy to do with FX. Uh, I have to do a lot of animations. I need to move the screen, so animation was 
uh, a requirement, binding, so I'm binding the values from the readings from the sensor to my layers, so easy to update X number of layers, uh, multi-threading, so I have to have one thread getting the information from the sensors, but I have to be responsive in my UI, so I have to have both. So multi-threading was required in my project, and it was something that I was mature enough and I knew enough to, to use it. So I think it was just the perfect choice for me. Again, uh, be careful when you need to do things like that in JavaFX. Um, the UI cannot be unresponsive, so you have to, if you need to be listening to something, make sure you put it in the own thread. And the way in JavaFX we do it is through a task. So you create a task, and in the call method is when you do whatever it is the things that you need to do. So put it in a separate thread so it doesn't block your UI. And the last piece was binding. Uh, we are all familiar with binding, uh, and the way I did is each layer was bound, so the coordinate of each layer was bound to some information of the sensor. Um, so the sensor values change, all the layers were updated accordingly. So it was very easy to update all the layers um, at once. With that, let's shoot the demo. Okay. So I don't want, I don't know if you want to show something in here. Can you see? Oh, let me power so we have a little bit more light. Uh, let me unplug my computer. Um, I can either use um, Ethernet, uh, but I'm just going to connect uh, a keyboard so I can actually type in the console and, and get things easier. So I have a mouse. Okay. Okay, so we have the Pi coming up. So we have the screen. So we have the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Um, and this is the sensor. It goes straight to the GPIO lines. This is just the connection to the screen. The screen is the ones that power the Raspberry Pi. That's what's kind of weird for me. So this USB is actually powering the Pi. Uh, and then we have the sensor, uh, the touch sensor from the screen goes to the Pi via USB. And that's pretty much it. We don't have anything extra. We have the SD card. What? Beautiful woodwork. <laughs> it's actually, no, it's, it's kind of a sponge now. Sponge. It's, yeah, and then covered with metallic paper. So it looks like, like metal, but it's, it's, it's plastic. Don't be fooled. And so the Raspberry Pi come up. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to log in. OK, I'm just going to the directories where I have the demos. I'm just going to make sure that the sensors are working. trying to get into the right directory. Hold on. I love this tiny mouse, this tiny keyboard, but sometimes typing could be ah, tricky. You prefer those flexible keyboards I use for all of them? Uh, yeah, I love those. I'm going to steal one of those. So from Brazil, one of those is going to be missing, just for you to know. <laughs> OK, so let's see if the sensors, sensor testing is working. So let's test the sensors. Um, I don't know if you're able to. So pretty much we're getting zeros and one. Do you want me to get? Well, oh, well if I hold it up, it's going to change. Okay, okay, okay. 
<laughs> so, well, this is, I mean, it's not that interesting, just a bunch of volumes. So, minus we're 36. Gonna, we're going to need to make it work shortly. Yes. Man. That's probably a good distance. Okay. Okay, so as I flip it, you can see minus. 12, 20 degrees, 25, so that's actually the angle in degrees, 30, 38, 40, 43, negative, and then going to the other, it goes positive, and then if I go to you, I should get a pretty high on Y value, so 41, 43, 46, 7, I think it goes all the way to, what is the reading? I cannot really see, 77, 70, yeah, so it's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty good. And then if I turn, so we see that the reading, we're getting an accurate reading, so we can actually shoot the UI. That is the interesting part. These are just numbers. Okay. Clearly, I should not quit my day job and become a cameraman. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know what you're focusing on. Okay, hopefully. So I need a flat, so I do some calibration. Um, and hopefully it configure the devices, the sensors. It take a little time while it loads the, the, the multiple layers. Once the layers are up, it's, it's a way better uh, performance. It's coming up, we have the mouse. Okay, so we have the screen. So, hopefully, as I move, sorry Steve, it's gonna be kinda hard. So you can see how the multiple layers, and then the whole idea with this is, as you move, you can actually see, discover things in the environment, like treasures that are hidden otherwise behind the layers and stuff like that. Let me just pull back. And you can see if I keep moving the layers, you can see the multiple layers on the top. And then you can play with the speed. Oh, there's another treasure here. Uh, you can see, um, you can play with different, with the speeds. I mean, if you want to move it faster, slower, um, create more. Uh, for me, I think I have like a minimum angle that is required for the movement. So if I just turn a little bit, it doesn't detect anything. I have, I have a minimum. 20 degrees or something, so it's able to detect something. So you can play with those value, but the whole idea is. Okay, so I know you guys actually want to come up and physically see this. So yeah, there's, you, come to the front of the you can play with it. Oops, we cannot go very far as I have the power. Yeah. Let me put it to the beginner. So you, you, you basically pre-constructed the 3D images on Store the 3D images and you just bring it back? It's actually 2D. There is nothing, is, nothing oh. is 3D. 2D, different layers. So it's one, so there are if, different multiple images, one on top of each other. They have a layer ordering. So the farther away the layer, the slower it moves. The closer, uh, the faster it moves. So that's pretty much. And then I have an animation. Again, it's, it's a small one, and believe it or not, it's just doing that small area. It takes forever to create the UI, so <laughs> I put it back up. Let me go try to get it back from there. Again, another improvement will be like a speed. The more, the more slope that you have, the faster it will move. I'm just trying to put it back to the beginning. It's not that I'm hiding it from you or anything. <laughs> I'm just trying to go back. Somehow it doesn't want to. But that's, you can play with it a little bit. So again, uh, yeah. Quick question. So yes. What's the latency between the actual registering the value to it you having some type of reaction on the screen? Uh, I haven't really measured that. Um, so and for me, I don't have I don't require like a 
like a real time kind of response. It, it was more like a game. So I wasn't too concerned about that. I was more concerned about having something that gave me that, that effect that I was looking for. So I can. You're creating a racing game. You want to <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that I want to do with a wearable PC is there is this device, um, Talmic, Talmic Inc. There is um, a Canadian startup, and what they're doing, they're doing a bracelet where they can actually read your finger movement, the gesture. So it can actually detect by your tendons how you wrist move or fingers. So they will do some gesture recognition. So that's my whole idea, to have the Raspberry Pi and being able to control my Raspberry Pi with the wrist, uh, just by moving my fingers or my hand. Uh, control the UI. So I was looking into flying an airplane with my hands, like, you know, taking off, blowing, you know, going around. So, and then, but, <laughs> but they haven't, they still haven't released the devices. So while I'm waiting, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a gyroscope here in my hand and I'm looking for some bend sensor so I can actually at least add reading from my fingers. But pretty much it can give me like, you know, the, the reading of my hands, acceleration. So I'm, I'm looking into something temporary solution while the Talmic wristbands are available. I think it's going to be super cool. So, so um, can you control the assembly rates? Or you know, as, they run as fast as the clock rate. The sampling rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I, again, I wasn't too concerned about. I think I'm reading. I don't remember how often I'm reading for the sensors. Um, I don't remember to be honest. Uh, Certainly, the upper bound would be the clock. Yeah, the but yeah, but again, I, I wasn't too concerned about that too much of, you know, real time reading or anything like that because it was just for, you know, having this impact. So I wasn't too concerned about that or going into, into that. So again, and maybe not very useful things, but a, a lot of fun. And again, that's one of the things that I'm planning to do with the wearable PC, having some gaming um, devices. So again, there is cool, I don't know, there are cool devices out there. A lot of them use an I square C that I didn't even imagine now that I have it working, it's just, it's fun. It's a lot of things. Um, so I think that's all I have for you. Again, um, I think the Raspberry Pi, I love it. I think it's really cool device. running on Java 1, a 3D environment on a Raspberry Pi. So you can actually have a very sophisticated 3D environment on the Raspberry Pi. So I think it's a great tool. It's just your imagination that is, um, that's what you need to use, your imagination, and see what is the next cool things that you're going to build. Um, Java works great. Again, just decide if you want to go with Java ME embedded or SE embedded. What, what is more important for you? For me, the most important was the UI. I really need it. Um, again, opportunities are limitless. Um, just a lot of fun. I think technology is a lot of fun. Uh, I see it every day on my work. I love my work and I love playing with devices. So let's see what is the next big things that we build. <laughs> cool. All right, so how yeah. complex was the parallax code in that very it's actually extremely simple. I think it's, it's I, I, again, what it took me the most was creating the layers. That's really time consuming. The Photoshop part is, ah, oh, is the worst. Thanks God we normally have like, you know, graphic designers that will do their job. But if I'm a system engineer trying to do their job, it takes me forever. So that was one thing. And finding little stuff like having things working and the blacklisting, you know, digging why it's not working. Otherwise, the code is very simple. It's pretty much the layers. Uh, each layer um, um, has a position. So the farther away, the slower it moves, but pretty much it's binding to the values that are being read on the sensors. So it's pretty, it's pretty clean and easy code. Have you experimented with another device called a SenseBot? That's uh, some ecosystem on device. Well, that is not really using, that was using an old VM that it was called the Squawk VM. Yeah. 
Um, so I don't know what is, have you, do you know the status of the squawk, I think? Yeah, they're, they're now the IT team. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they're doing something with them, I'm not really sure. Yeah, so the, the, the Sunspot guys, I think, are working on some of the new technologies we're going to be releasing. But um, the, the old Sunspot hardware, I think, is no longer being pushed forward. Yeah. So it had a lot of the same sensors you, you thought you can attach to Raspberry Pi. Um, but now the, the model for how people build this sort of stuff has kind of changed. And again, it has a different VM and everything. It was has yeah, a squawk VM. Yeah, much more powerful yeah exactly. Processing wise than the um, Sunspots were. You use more generic SE, right? Yeah, this is just SE embedded. Yeah. So. You could use the Sunspot just for playing the plane, <laughs> just to keep it in your hand. We'll have yeah, to. See. Yeah, you could communicate between a Raspberry Pi and a, mm -hmm. a Sunspot, so and use it just as an additional sensor like controller. And it's it's, it's much lower power than the Raspberry Pi. It's much harder to get good portable power solutions for the Raspberry Pi. So you could you can use your your Pi as a base station, a ba so <laughs> collect, and then use use as the spots or something that's more yeah. efficient as on a roaming device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what you do today is you'd probably, if you're building it from scratch, you'd use uh, one of the new Java ME low power boards coming out um, together with some sensors hooked up using the same um, device API that we support for Java ME and we'll support for Java SE in the future. And it'll let you do everything with a, a full Java VM, either Java ME or Java SE across both devices. That'd probably be the easiest solution. Okay, so any other questions for Angela? All right, so let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you.